this is uh, happy, happy Mother's Day to all of our beautiful, smiling mothers this morning. And uh, on this glorious first day of the week, we've uh, come together via technology to study God's word and then enter into a time of worship here in, in a little bit. Um, if I may, let, let me uh, lead us in a word of prayer before Matthew continues with our study in the book of Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, our great God, our Lord, our Creator, we do humbly and reverently bow before you, the great I am, on this beautiful, wonderful first day of the week that we can arise from our beds this morning and come together at this time to study your holy word, Father, and we pray come to a, a deeper understanding of your will for us as we seek to live for you and love you, love each other, and journey through this life to heaven. Father, we are grateful for everybody who has joined us this morning to study your word. Pray you'll bless us all, bless Brother Matthew as he as he teaches us, pray that you'll give him guidance and wisdom and, and discernment as he presents the things that he has prepared in a way that would help us to grow as your people, to be what you want us to be in this life as we journey towards heaven. Forgive us of any sin that would hinder our relationship with you. Bless us as we go through this day for your honor and glory. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your wonderful son, our savior. Amen. Let me take this opportunity to wish a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and wives, at least all of our adult females. But we are truly blessed to have you among our men, and hopefully we will always show this appreciation for you, not just on today, but on all days uh, of the year, as we should as Christians. We're going to start the third uh, portion of the outline that I pointed out in Acts 1 and 8. Uh, we're going to now go to the ends of the earth. If Matt will pull that one up for me. So there it is in verse 8 there. You shall be witnesses to me. And then I cut out part of it into the end of the earth. So, where it's going to go. And it's not hard to see uh, that chapters 13 through 48 are primarily Paul's actions. Of course, he has others with him, and uh, I'll point that out. We begin with he and Barnabas, uh, uh, but before we get to uh, that, there's a few introductory things I want to uh, talk about here. I'll go back to chapter and pick up a couple of things from chapter 12 to kind of lay the groundwork for what we are doing. Next one, please, Matt. So we can see that Paul's contributions to the church were of a great impact. I mean, he uh, did a lot for the church in his travel. I'll point that out a little bit briefly because we don't really get into the travels until Wednesday evening. He had little to do with the spread of the gospel in Jerusalem and throughout Judea and Samaria. That's not where his work was, even though he did do a bit of preaching in uh, Jerusalem. And I, I don't have in, haven't seen anything in the record where he may have preached in uh, Judea and all Samaria, but he did preach a bit in Jerusalem. And if you remember it, I'll point it out later, he got in trouble for preaching in Jerusalem. I'll kind of highlight why he got in trouble a bit later. Next one, Matt. More than any other apostle, or any other evangelist, is he given credit 
for spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth. It's Paul. He preached the gospel throughout Asia Minor, in Greece, in Ma Macedonia, in Illyricum, and that's modern day Albania and a part of Yugoslavia. And, it, and he did that probably after he got done in Macedonia on one of his trips. He mentioned it in Romans chapter 15, verse number 19. So he's moving the gospel and he's not afraid to preach it. You could have stayed there mad and went to the next one. So he's doing a good job of it. We are told now at 1225 that Barnabas and Saul returned to Antioch. They also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. I'm going to talk a little about surnames and, and things of that. If, if uh, you'll look at it, uh, this John, you'll see him later in Acts. We will also see him in other places in the Bible. For instance, we'll see him in Colossians as well as 2 Timothy. He's in the mention in Scripture. So. He is, becomes quite prominent. I might add, uh, most theologians and historians take this John Mark to be the one who wrote the book of Mark, and it would have been dictated to him by Peter. So uh, this is the John Mark we have. Next one, please, Matt. So uh, we'll see him later. Surname. This word surname can be confused. In modern day, surname is your last name. But if you look at it in scripture and you study it, you'll find out it's the given name in scripture. And I've got several examples down here if Matt will show them to me. So scripturally speaking, Scripturally speaking, it would be the given name. For instance, Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice. Simon, who was surnamed Peter. So scripture, we're pointing to the uh, uh, given name. But in nowadays, my, your surname, mine is Conley. My given name is Matthew. So it, it's a bit different. And oftentimes in... Uh, over history, things will flip themselves. I could take several words from the 1611 version of the King James Bible and show you where the, but the meaning of the word has totally flipped from one thing to another. So since we we deal with we're dealing with living languages, it, that happens uh, quite a bit. Uh, uh, for instance, just thinking colloquially. In the 1950s, when I was a youngster, uh, growing up, the word gay meant happy. That's what it means today, though. When I was growing up, the word sex meant what gender you were. But that's not what it means in colloquial English today. So it flip flop it changed uh, in accordance with how the word is used. Next slide, please, Matt. So then, let's review Saul. He was born in Tarsus of Cilicia. He was educated in Jerusalem. He was taught by Gamaliel. He was a fa he it was a Pharisee. He's a Pharisee, and he goes on. You can run these kind of quick, Matt. So uh, taught by Gamaliel. Now, he's taught to be a Pharisee. He's a Roman citizen as well. He, he is definitely an early leader in the persecution of the church. And when I, we talk about his persecution of the church, I'm going to bring it back later. But at this time, we have to realize that uh, persecution, he would have been quite obstinate. He would have been quite truculent. He would have been quite uh, recalcitrant. And he would have been uh, always 
one who would be a blocker to what was going on. And it's important we remember these things about him as we start seeing him flip. Next uh, slide, please. He was converted in Damascus. And after his conversion, he preached in Syria, Asia, Asia Minor, Macedonia, Illyricum, uh, modern Albania, and part of Yugoslavia, I'll say again, Greece and Rome. So if you consulted a map, you would see that he covered a wide area of the Roman Empire in his preaching. Uh, and uh, when I say Asia Minor, I probably could have said Asia first because we've got a small portion of Asia Minor that was called Asia uh, during the period of history we are dealing with. And I'll bring that out when we get to it later in, in the study of the book of Acts. But we have to remember when, when we'll see Asia at that time, he's not talking about the entire continent of Asia. He will be talking about one small area of Asia. Luke will, I, I'm talking about. But he did cover this large part. If you look at consulted a map today, and you look at Macedonia, look at a, during that period of time, you look at Macedonia, and you look at Yugoslavia and Albania, where you'd have to go to a globe really to do it. That's where I consulted. I got a globe at my house, so I consulted. That's a, quite a large area he would have been covering. I am almost uh, completely amazed at how much ground Paul covered in his uh, evangelism. He was truly dedicated once he was converted. He was truly a dedicated man. It doesn't show up in his I initial conversion, but it does show up if, if you follow him across the Roman Empire as he went about preaching. Next slide, Matt. He wrote 13, possibly 14, of the New Testament epistles. The possibly 14th one would be uh, the book of Hebrews. There are several uh, statements or narratives in the book of Hebrews that would point to him maybe writing it or dictating it. And there are also several narratives that would uh, that don't carry his signature that would point to maybe someone else writing that epistle. So we'll say uh, no one knows for sure. He wrote 13 though for sure because they've got his signature on them. We we can't miss that. Although some uh, theologians think will come out and say, well, I don't believe Paul wrote this. I don't believe he dictated. Well, he dictated most of them, but he always put his signature at the end of it, which is, is uh, his trademark, shall we say. So then, when he heads to Damascus, his mission changes to a commission, if you, if you please. When he meets Jesus about 20 miles south of Damascus, we believe, uh, and he finds out that Jesus was alive, it tends to make him a changed man from what he had been. I don't know why I put that uh, colon in there, probably because I forgot to put from in there. Uh, so uh, it wasn't just a poof that he was changed. Uh, there are markers in the record that show uh, that it took a little time for him to change. He was a reasonable man, though. He considered the facts as they related to God's word. And so that's uh, what uh, caused the switch from being a persecutor to uh, being a, a proclaimer is uh, the fact that he was reasonable and he considered the facts as they related to God's word. What do I mean by that? He considered the facts that he had read or uh, learned in the Old Testament when he was being schooled by Gamaliel. 
Now he adds that to what he gets from, from uh, Christ on the road to Damascus, and then he, he, he has to add something else to that. Next one, please, Matt. So he firmly decides to obey the gospel just as it was presented to him by Ananias. And all you gotta do is look at Acts 22, 12 through 17. Now, uh, he was told that by Ananias what he had to do to be saved. He also gave him a brief description of the uh, mission that Christ was assign had assigned him. And Christ gives him that mission as well, if, if you study the uh, record carefully. Uh, and what we need to remember now, when he's told by Ananias what to be, do to be saved, the whole plan of salvation is not mentioned there, those five actions that are to be based. So what we have here is a synecdoche. A synecdoche is using a part to represent the whole or the whole to represent the part. And you'll see that frequently in scripture. A synecdoche will be used. So you don't get him telling, uh, as you read it here in the scripture, you don't get, you get all of what he told to Saul. Even though he told it to him, it's not here. That's a given. I'll point it out again a little bit late, but that is a given. And it's something we need to remember as we see all uh, records of conversions. There are eight of them here in the book of Acts, uh, distinct ones. Next one, oh, thank you, Matt. So Paul is appointed to be a servant and a witness for the Lord. He's supposed to take the gospel to the Gentiles and the Jews that were in the uh, dispersion of them from the uh, captivity. They're all over the Ro Roman Empire. So he's appointed to take the gospel to the Gentiles as well as Jews who were spread over the world, if you please. That's the Roman world. So in order for him to be a witness, he has to have known Christ. And that will come out, I'll show you how he knew Christ and love him. He has to have the same experience with him as the, the uh, original 12 or the original 11 plus Matthias. Next one, Matt. So we need to understand Saul had been obnoxious. He had been recalcitrant. He had been truculent. Uh, he had been a, a, a person who was going to block anything. He, he was uh, obstinate as well. That don't just disappear from a person with a poof. That's what I meant by poof earlier. It don't just jump out of it. Something got to be worked out of him. Just like we need to understand when we convert it. Now, sometimes we don't see it or don't realize it. But there's a change that takes place in us, and some of that change is gradual. The big change that takes place when a person is uh, initially converted is the fact that they set their mind on doing what God wants them to do. That's what the repentance and the confession is. My mind is set on it. So immediately after his uh, Baptism, that's the completion of his conversion, he preaches the gospel in Damascus. But now he's got to acquire uh, the knowledge of Christ that the other apostles had. That's what happens when he goes to Arabia. He gets that. All you got to do is read Galatians and you, uh, and you connect it back to what's going on in Acts and you'll see it. Then and there's something else that goes on with Saul. This next one, Matt. He preached in Damascus again after the, the, he had gone to Arabia. And this time, when he comes back to Damascus and he preaches, it's not too long before everybody want to kill him again. So then 
uh, uh, he has to escape from Damascus because there's been a plot to take his life. There are two things that we want, might see here. The first thing that we might see, there's still some of that obstinacy in uh, Saul, and it, there may even been some truculence in it. That's still there. And so that's going to help the ones that he is preaching to to decide they need to get rid of him. That's got to be worked out of Saul. Then he uh, goes to Jerusalem. He finally gets to return to Jerusalem where he had left on the mission and got the commission. So now he gets back to Jerusalem. And when he gets back, he wants to join the other believers. But they're justifiably afraid of Saul, and they should be afraid of it, it. It is a good thing they were afraid of. But there's something that happens to Saul when he gets back to Jerusalem, and he tries to join the other disciples. And that is, he runs into Barnabas. Now we start to see why Barnabas goes along with him. Barnabas is going to be able to smooth out the, the, the things that uh, Saul's roughness. And so the first thing he does is he's able to convince the apostles, the leadership of the Jerusalem church. He's able to uh, convince them uh, Saul is sincere. So now he preaches the gospel in Jerusalem. And look at the short time he preaches. There are only 15 days. And we got another plot on this life. That's part of uh, Paul's uh, his, his personality, his uh, tendency. Uh, uh, to have some of his old ways. That's got to be worked out of. And God has a plan to work that out of. So then, when, when the second plot's on his life, of, uh, where the first plot in Jerusalem, uh, on his life, he escapes the plot and he returns to uh, Tarsus via Caesarea. So he's taking the Caesarea, and then he goes on up around uh, to uh, Tarsus of C Cilicia. And so there he re remains for a while. Next one, Matt. So then we are told when we get him back up to Tarsus, Barnabas goes to Tars, to Tars, goes to uh, Antioch, and he goes up to Tarsus because he finds out he needs help and brings Saul back down to Antioch. And when he gets in there, they spend the whole year working in Antioch. And uh, that's back in chapter 11. Brethren of Antioch, decided because prophets had come up to Antioch from Jerusalem and the prophet Agabus had predicted the famine that would be, he said, over the whole world, meaning the Roman Empire. Uh, but he uh, prophesied that the brethren of Antioch, and what I need you to understand, when we say brethren of Antioch, we got to realize that the most of the brethren there would probably have been Gentile. They had, they're having converted to Christ. They know what love for their fellow uh, man is their brethren. Uh, a brethren here, uh, almost every time you see brethren translated, it's going to be some form of the Greek word adelphois which means siblings, not just uh, men, the siblings, okay? So they decide they want to send relief to their fellow Christians 
in Judea. And they could come up with the relief package and send it to Judea by Barnabas and Saul. And after they have completed the task of taking that relief down to the impoverished Judean Christians, they return to Antioch and they bring with them one John Mark. John Mark gets to be very important in the scriptures. Next one, please, Matt. So well, then he, uh, Luke takes the time to let us know that there are certain prophets and teachers. He tells us that among them, uh, you'll see the name Barnabas, and at the end of that list of prophets and teachers will be Saul. Uh, prophets and teachers, uh, the prophets, the preacher, and, and the others be your teacher. The next slide will tell us that there's a Manaean. He was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. And it's important uh, that they mention he was brought up with the Herod, Herod the Tetrarch. Herod the Tetrarch is one of Herod the Great's sons. He was the first husband to the Bernice that we will re meet later when we get down to Acts 25. He's the first husband. Even though he's uh, uh, Bernice, is Herod the Tetrarch's uh, brother's daughter. That's his wife. So she is the daughter of uh, Aristobulus. And so even though she's his niece, she's his first wife. Then uh, we ought to be able to see that a person who's brought up with this evil group can change. So this man had changed. So that's why it's brought out that he was the one who was brought up with Herod, Herod the Tetrarch. We can see that some type of change is taking place here in that individual. He's become one who would uh, do what the, the Lord would require. And we can see this throughout the early church. Uh, uh, a lot of the love and the affection that they had for each other because they had decided to love the Lord. Thereby, it magnifies what the, the Lord Jesus had said back in Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39, I believe it is. You shall love the Lord your God, and you shall love the, your neighbor as yourself. And so this shows up in these early Christians vividly you can see. Next one, Matt. Paul is an apostle just as sure as the 12 were. And this point is made numerous times by Paul himself. You can see it in Galatians 1 and 2 and 2 Corinthians chapters 10 through 12. He, he received knowledge and the plan of God by revelation. That shows up in Galatians 1, uh, 1 through uh, 12, 11 and 12. I get that right sooner or later. And 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 7. So he, he got his knowledge through inspiration. Now, the other apostles had gotten theirs through association. So Paul gets it by inspiration. They get it through association. We get it by perspiration. We got to put some time into this thing if we want to understand this plan of salvation for mankind. So Paul also has a full measure of the Holy Spirit. He has the same measure that the 12 received. It enabled him to do the things that he had been appointed to do when we go back to Acts chapter 9, when he's first selected. He gets the measure of the Holy Spirit after he has become a Christian, not before now. In this case, it's after. Okay, let's go ahead to the next one, Matt. 
although the details are not given, he was definitely baptized in the Holy Spirit. You can't argue that. He, he, he was able to do the works that only apostles were able to do. That required a baptism of the Holy Spirit. We'll see an example of that in Acts chapter 19. I believe it's verses 1 through 10 or somewhere about there. So he, he is a definite witness of Christ. Uh, and that uh, criterion that was laid out in Acts chapter 1, that it had been with Christ all during his walk on earth, is not applied here. He got that when he went to Arabia. At three years, he's been out there. So he gets what he needed in a, that enabled him to do the work out there. Okay, so he does everything the apostles do, laying on of hands, uh, imparting the uh, gifts of the spirit. These are the uh, the gifts of the Spirit that enable the new church to coalesce and be edified and grow and spread all over the Roman Empire, all over the world, if you please. Next one, please, Matthew. And you know, we start to see that immediately with uh, his encounter with Elemis as he immediately starts doing some of the same uh miracles that the apostles were shown doing the past 12 chapters oh we're going to see that i got that in this lesson okay so the holy spirit selects barnabas and saul as a movement to further god's plan of salvation for all gentiles and all of the jews of the dispersed which in turn represents the whole world even if you saw it today is going to represent the whole globe in it eventually. We need to re remember always that even though Christianity was rapidly uh, spreading throughout the Roman Empire, it had to be confirmed by God. And that's going to require some knowledge on the part of the one who spread the gospel or who's preaching the gospel had to be able uh, to uh, do what God would have to be done to confirm his word. And that's where the qualification as an apostle came in. They were the superstar. Now you got uh, the other disciples who were stars because they were able to preach and some of them were able to confirm. We could saw that in the case of Philip the evangelist. Excellent, Matt. Now we need to bear in mind as we look at all of this that this is humans they were dealing with. And all humans have their own unique idiosyncrasies. Every one of us have. This would make it extremely difficult uh, to deal with some, especially those uh, Asiatic Jews, because we'll see them popping up the block time and time again. And when they try and block, they have an adverse effect on the Gentiles who, who are converted. Saul was eminently qualified for the task of explaining Christ as the Messiah because he has an extensive knowledge of the Old Testament, if you please. That would have been the scriptures to them at, during this time in the first century. He has the extensive knowledge, and Barnabas has the demeanor and personality which puts a great addition to Saul's talent. It's going to help to mitigate some of Saul's uh, shall we say, adverse uh, traits. It's going to help to mitigate it, and it's also going to help the Saul to learn and, and, and see. He's a quick, fast learner now, we need to understand. He's not a slow learner like Peter was on um, certain things. Paul learns it quick, 
quickly. And the reason he learns it much quicker than Peter is his extensive knowledge of the Old Testament. Once he converts to Christ, he puts that Old Testament knowledge to use where he can be a uh, solid convincer of God's word that Christ is the Messiah. He's going to be able, with Barnabas' assistance, he's going to be able to get this over to the Gentiles now. Uh, it won't be so hard in getting it to the God-fearing Gentile, but it's going to be quite a different story when you are dealing with one who has no knowledge, absolutely no knowledge of the Old Testament. And it takes a while to work that out of uh, people who don't have that knowledge. And we can see that in modern day America, in our society today, that is going to be a terrible time trying to convert people uh, into being uh, a follower of Christ. And so he and Barnabas are cut out for this, all by his extensive knowledge, and Barnabas by his uh, great personality and his encouraging, his tendency to be an encouraging. After the Holy Spirit selects, the ch church select Paul and Barnabas, or Barnabas and Saul, I had that wrong, the, the, they fast, they prayed and they laid hands on Barnabas and Saul and sent them away on their journey. We need to understand now, in the church leadership, they don't have the same power that an apostle has. When they lay their hands on, they're just appointing them. And what are they appointing them? They're appointing them as apostles. You'll see one place Barnabas will be uh, referred to as an apostle. But he is an apostle of the church at Antioch. He's a representative. He's uh, representing Christ through Saul and through himself, but he is an apostle of the Church of Antioch. So it doesn't mean he's an apostle as the 12 uh, were or as Saul has become. So then, on their way, the first place they go is to Seleucia. Seleucia is, is a coastal city. And so I'm sure he preached there and if there's a synagogue there, he probably established a church from some portion of that synagogue. And from this uh, city, they sail to Cyprus. I wonder why they went to Cyprus. You, you can kind of associate that with the, his assistant, Tansy. Isn't that where Barnabas was from? I believe so. So then he takes Barnabas and, and they've got John Mark with them, and they head out to Cyprus. They get to Cyprus now. The first place they're going to go to is a city called Salamis, or some people pronounce it Salamis. Salamis. Uh, it's their first stop, and, and uh, that when they get in there, they preach there, and they establish a congregation at Sal Salamis. And from Salamis, they work their way over to a city called Paphos, where they meet, as George was telling us a few minutes ago, where they meet Bar Jesus, who's a Jewish uh, false prophet. His name is, uh, as was translated to be Columbus. And so he, this old false prophet, uh, he's got an ulterior motive here. Uh, he's there with Sergius Paulus, who's the proconsul uh, of the area. Sergius Paulus is an intelligent man, and he sends for Barnabas and Saul, and he sought to hear the word of God. But oh, Elymas, he doesn't agree with that. Uh, he, he don't think Sergius Paulus needs to be uh, following God. I wonder who's prompting that. You think it might be Satan? That, that, that's his job, isn't it? That's what he's made his job. I'm going to work through somebody to get someone to go against God's word. And so 
he, he don't want Sergius Paulus getting uh, converted to Christ. He knows, he sees what it is. And why does he not? Well, look, let's look at what Elements was. He's a false prophet, teach things wrong. Not only that, but he's a sorcerer. He knows if uh, Sergius Paulus gets converted, I've got a problem now in dealing with me. Not going to believe me anymore. So I'm going to try to quit. So push up that next one, Matt. So then, he, 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 he withstands them. He, he, he seeks to block them. And he's turning them away from the faith, uh, he thinks, because uh, <laughs> it's going to lessen his influence with the proconsul. Uh, so now, all of a sudden, in the 13th verse of chapter 13, we get uh, the Paul, Saul being changed to Paul, uh, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. So I'm, I, I want to point out at this point, you go back and look at all of the mention of he and Barnabas together is Barnabas and Saul. But from now on, it's going to be Paul and Barnabas. So they flip-flop positions, if you please. So Saul, uh, he makes a statement. So uh, Elymas, this uh, sorcerer, he, he uh, says to him, uh, you, you are uh, full of all deceit. And all fraud and pull it. I think I have that, that verse uh, in my outline, man. Yeah, so full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you're an enemy of all righteousness. Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Uh, he, he really, what he's doing, he's really telling him what he's about to do to him. Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> elements don't realize the power he's up against. Not the power of Saul, but he's up against the power of God. Don't think it's Saul. It, this is God you, you're against. So Paul pronounces God's sinners on him. That's blind. And he's gonna be blind for a period. And I believe the Bible kind of uh, refers to him as walking around trying to get people to show him about. We are told that then the proconsul believed. Why does he believe? Because now he's seen this word that Paul is preaching being confirmed. He had heard about it before, but now he knows about it. He understands it in no uh, un, uh, in no outline. I can't even think of the words. But anyway, he understands and knows that what Paul is preaching is God's truth. Necessary inference will dictate that all five actions set forth in the Lord's plan of salvation were taken. And this is true in any case of someone coming to truly believe God's word. In any case, that's going to happen. If they truly believe, then they're going to follow those steps. They, that don't mean they're saying, okay, I got this done, I got that done, I got that done. No, this is just going to come. And one of the main things we have to remember here is the, what takes place in, in this land of salvation when one confirms his or her belief in, in, in God's plan of salvation. It comes that right down to what we find in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, where uh, the writer of Hebrews states, that even though he were a son, son meaning Jesus, son of God, even though he were a son, uh, he, uh, he was obedient to the point of death. And having been made complete or perfect, if you please, 
haven't been made perfect. I say complete though normally. Haven't been made complete. He has become the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. He don't say believe. He says obey. So it tells me that I cannot be saved unless I obey him. So then if I believe him, I'm going to obey him. And I think that shows up there. Shows up everywhere for me anyway. All right. Now, where's the study? It's going to cover Acts 13, 13 through 52. Even though we only had 13 verses here, we're going to have 13 through 52. And what we are going to be looking at is, uh, I'm going to push up the prologue to, to the first journey of Paul. His first journey is with he and Barnum. Next slide, Matt. His first journey probably took place sometime AD 44, 45, that time period. 30 years are covered by this book of Acts. And probably half of that 30 is gone by the beginning of the first journey that Paul makes. Places that visited on the first journey was Seleucia first, then they sailed to Cyprus where they went to Salamis and Paphos. Then they go into Galatia. These are the churches of the book of Galatians. Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. They go to those places next. Then on their <coughs> return, they go to Perga uh, uh, of Pamphylia. Now I failed to uh, put it up there, but when they left the Paphos and they come back before they went into uh, Galatia, they were with the program. That's what John Mark decided he had hit the bricks and go back to uh, Jerusalem. He couldn't take it too much for him. Then they went to Antioch and Iconium, Lystra and Derby. And we find out that when they were at Lystra, they, uh, well, we'll talk about that Wednesday. I better leave that alone. John Mark went to Jerusalem for Perga. And so when they leave Derby, uh, Lystra it would be when they were coming back on the return they went to Perga of Pamphylia and then to Italia of Pamphylia. From there they go back to the church at Antioch which ends that first journey. Well I, I believe I was right about on time. I thank you for your attention. Thank you for your comment George. I turn it back over to you Ron. Okay, Matthew. Hey, thank you so much. Wonderful study. Wonderful study. Appreciate your knowledge of God's word and uh, just fantastic, enthusiastic way to, that you present it to us. We're blessed. We're blessed to have you. Yeah. You know, every now and then you get one of those aha moments. And mm -hmm. I kind of knew this, but it just came, came through clearly this morning. You know, Saul was converted on the road to Damascus, but the Lord still had to do a lot of work on him to make him the man that he needed to be. You know, the three years in Saudi and down in Arabia and uh, all the attempts on his life. And then you look over in 2 Corinthians 11 and he lists all the, the trials and tribulations he, he went through. You just wonder, why did God allow him, the great apostle Paul, that was tasked with taking the precious news of the gospel to the, to the whole world, why would he let him suffer and go th through such trials and tribulations and difficulties? And yeah, God was c continuing to work on him uh, all through his life. And, you know, it just came clearly home to me and maybe to, to everybody here this morning, you know, troubles and trials and tribulations ain't always bad. They can be, they can work that joy, I think, that uh, James talks about. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter those trials and troubles and tribulations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So thank you, Brother Matthew. 
great study. I might add to that, but it's an example for us for the problems we go through uh, so much. And the greatest Christian in my mind that ever was is uh, Paul. And yet we see what he had to go through. 